absolute pleasure to be here with you today and to conclude with this intense but amazing week um, during our workshop on connecting the unconnected and how AI can bridge the digital divide and bring more inclusion. Thank you also to those who are connected online. Uh, my name is Diane East, and I'm the director of European Public Policy and the Government of the team of Cisco. I'm based in Brussels, and I will be moderator for this workshop. So what's on the agenda for today? So first, I will give a brief presentation. Uh, here, from here. Here? Can you well? Yeah. Ah, OK. Closer. <laughs> Uh, so what's on the agenda for the workshop today? So first we will uh, begin with a quick uh, introduction, setting the scene, uh, what is Cisco, what is uh, AI, and the, what responsibility, what the responsible technology means for us. Then I will have the pleasure to introduce our fantastic panelists here. Uh, then we will move on to a, to, a, to a deep dive discussion. And then of course we will uh, open the door for Q&A uh, and make sure that we have a lively discussion. All right, so let's start right in. Uh, 2024 is the year of AI. Do you all agree? Yeah? <laughs> so that is also what our CEO, Jeff Robbins, uh, shared when he was at Mobile World Congress a couple of months ago. Uh, and we can all agree that uh, maybe, you know, there will be many more years of AI, but what 2024 is really about is about tackling the opportunities and the challenges for once AI breaks. In terms of uh, what we have seen so far, uh, sorry, sure my slide, here we go. So we have seen many governments around the world moving ahead. More discussion around the global governance of AI, the risk of AI, also ahead of big elections, for example, I come from Brussels, we will have very soon European elections. We have, of course, US elections coming in November. Uh, and many of us we had also recently South Africa and India and you know, all voting uh, soon. So we definitely need to make sure that we address this information, the fakes, anything you know that can fool us on social media and on the ultimate. I would like just to spend a bit of time about Cisco. So if you don't know us, we have now 40 years of networking experience with that company that has built the internet. We're still focusing on building the best hardware on the planet, and we're also focused on creating and delivering together with a global ecosystem of trusted partners, the software and the services that help solve big problems faster and in a secure manner. Last year, we actually exceeded our goal to impact positively 1.1 billion people by 2025 through our social impact grants and also our signature programs in different areas that really are related to the UN SDGs, uh, such as critical human needs, economic empowerment, education, bringing in touch culture, and so on. But we wouldn't be there without the support of our key partners, such as ITU, for example, with whom we teamed up uh, to launch uh, Digital Transformation Center and many other programs in countries with the objectives of supporting them to strengthen uh, digital capacities of citizens, particularly in the underserved communities. What we know is that there's a lot still to do. Uh, we have one third of humanity that is still unconnected. So 2.6 billion people today are unconnected. When it comes to our uh, AI driven portfolio, our company has fully embraced it with a visionary and responsible approach. What we try to do is really to reimagine silicon from the ground up to power AI infrastructure and deploying AI solutions at scale with a comprehensive AI-driven portfolio that responsibly powers, connects, secures, and observes AI in all its forms. We are also true believers that uh, responsible AI has the potential, if applied in the right way, to be the greatest catalyst for economic and social progress. This is why many years ago, we did have developed this responsible AI framework around six key pillars, transparency, fairness, accountability, privacy, security, and reliability. What we know is that the internet is an ecosystem. So it's a full value chain and it doesn't stop at Cisco. This is why our teams are also assessing for privacy, for security, and human rights impact from the very beginning of the development throughout the end of the AI life cycle. 
Here are a few examples of how we join our search to advance the world externally. Uh, recently, your CEO, the province, uh, signed with both branches the wrong uh, goal for AI with remain the impact areas, it's its education and rights. He also recently was appointed to the US Department of Homeland Security, AI Safety, and Security Board with a project that we like the most, and I hope that we will spend a bit of time on this, is the launch last month on an AI-enabled ICT consortium with other uh, companies such as uh, Google, Amazon, SAP, and others to really assess the impact of AI on ICT jobs and identifying skill pathways for roles who are the most likely to be affected. I would like now for you to think about the possibility of AI. How can we together advance our goals? For years, our company has really tried to prioritize bridging the digital divide through our connectivity. We really know that we have a responsibility to give people a voice online, make sure that the algorithm and the data that are used to feed AI actually fully reflect our humanity. And we know that it is for everyday beauty if we want to have a truly diverse and inclusive offline mobile world. But at the end of the day, it's really up to all of us, right, to address that. So I have a question for you. And then after we will move to the QA, of course. And think about this. You will have about half an hour you know, to reflect on this before we move to the QA. How can AI actually help to connect the world to more in a meaningful way? I give you a start, and now I will move my life. So, uh, first, uh, I would like to introduce Executive Vice President and CEO of Nigerian Communication Solutions, Dr. Nunu Maina. It's an honor of you to have you here. Dr. Uh, Maina's vision focuses on fostering uh, growth in the technical sectors as a catalyst for broader economic development. Uh, then we have uh, Fontana uh, Hidmat Ibescu. As I told you, you know, we are, I was always in a key part of Cisco, and we are very lucky to have, uh, to have her here. So, Fontana advised uh, IT members and stakeholders of all the major policies and executive strategies to the needs of all end users to access information and communication technologies, particularly both in the vulnerable situation. I'm really looking forward to, to your insights and how it ends like that. Um, then we have Lucia uh, Aguilar, founder and CEO of Alstom, a strategy management services company dedicated to achieving a sustainability uh, impact by accelerating number 17 of the SDG partnership for the goals. Thank you so much, Lucia, for being here. You are also uh, an ambassador for you, and in fact, you are not also uh, your, your views on this one. Then, of course, we have Kathleen Kutonaida, who is Executive Chairman at the National AI and Cybersecurity ISAO. He is also the founder and Executive Chairman of the DOFA, Brian Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity. Uh, you have been also a judge for the Adult AI Footprint Contest for Climate Change in partnership with ITU, UNESCO, FDAO, IAEA, and the World Bank. So I think you will have also a lot to say. And then finally, First, for very own first year of Cisco, uh, who has been linked in Cisco's government relations uh, in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland since 2012, and has been a key driver on how to advance AI and digital policy across Europe. All right, now that the introductions are made, let's move on to the discussion. So, uh, I would like first to pick up with a general question for all of you. If 2024 is really the year of AI, how can we have <clears throat> a sort of a 360 approach to address important matters such as digital literacy, connectivity, inclusivity, you know, purpose driven technology. What are really the challenges and opportunities that you see? And what are the outcomes really that we should aim for? So maybe if I can start with you, Montana. Thank you. Well, I think. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. The question is very complex, and from my perspective, and given my areas of work, I will try to share with you a little bit of insights on how the artificial intelligence supports bridging the digital divide and actually um, making this digital society inclusive for all. So, in ITU, 
actually, uh, we have three main building blocks to build this inclusive digital society. And the first one is access, is connectivity. But connectivity is not enough because connectivity is a cable. Connectivity is physical, it's technological. You cannot put people's fingers in the tax and connect. And then we go to the second pillar, which is affordability to pay the connectivity, but also the demand that you are using in order to access the information and all the products and services that comes through. And the second one, and for me the most important that I would like to share with you today, is digital accessibility. Because digital accessibility is what we actually look at people use of technology. It's linked to the meaningful connectivity. If you don't have digital accessibility in place, you cannot say that the connectivity was meaningful because connectivity stayed alone, isolated in a cable. So with this in mind, uh, I would say that the good news is that artificial intelligence can definitely bust all of these three building blocks. So for instance, for the access connectivity, uh, I driven internet connectivity solutions such as dynamic spectrum annotation, for example, uses IE to optimize the use of available frequencies, reducing uh, congestion and improving internet access. Um, there are many other solutions, I'm not technical, so I'm very attached to uh, accuracy and I will go through the network optimization, the smart antennas, the satellite internet optimization, uh, edge computing and so on. That can be high speed internet, and this is the most important, to remote and unconnected, which is a subject people in the world. And don't forget that we are a third of the global population lives in remote and rural areas. So this is very important to enable these people also be included in the digital society, economy, and environment. Then in terms of affordability, I think it's obvious. The communication companies are already leveraging IE to optimize their networks, which improve performance, reduce operational costs, and with this, make internet access more affordable, also reliable for its users. But as told, we need the internet access payment, but we also need to reduce the cost of the device, because without the device, the, the Wi-Fi is not useful for us. And for this also, I see uh, that eye-driven automation in manufacturing can significantly reduce labor cost, and uh, as a result, leads to lower production costs and consequently more affordable devices, making digital products and equipment affordable for more people. Finally, the accessibility, as I told, enhance the development of accessible uh, products and services. Why? Because it empowers speech-to-text, text-to-speech, application that assist individuals with hearing and visual impairments, and similarly, AI tripod system devices can help those with physical disabilities perform their daily tasks, and with this, have an independent reading like everyone else. So um, in short, I believe that all these have a very strong impact in our daily life, but I don't want to conclude without going in, into the most important that for me is that even if I have the connectivity, the money to pay the connectivity on my device, and I also have the device which is affordable and all this, if I don't know how to use it, so if I don't have the training, the digital skills training, which should also be adapted to my specific uh, style of life or needs or capabilities, uh, I still uh, cannot be included in this digital society. You know? And for this, uh, what I want to, to share that we need two key requirements from my perspective. One, is to ensure that the platform that we are, through which we are delivering these uh, training courses are digitally accessible. Why? So the technicality of the platform. And here again, I place a key role in making learning platform digitally accessible and so inclusive through the personalized learning experience based on individual needs, providing tailored content, support to learners with different abilities and backgrounds and so on. But the key requirements of the technical platform 
stand on the digital accessibility standards and requirements. So some, some of you are familiar perhaps with the VGAC 2.1, with the AAA and so on. Uh, everything should be digitally accessible to include everyone. Otherwise, it wouldn't be for everyone. But once we have the technicality in place, we also have to have the content. And I will put a simple question. How many of you in all these photos that you are sharing with everyone these days, you put alternative text in your photos? Okay? So this type of thing, everyone should we should learn to live differently, to communicate differently, and to communicate into a digitally accessible format, because in this way, everybody can reach. And by the way, all of you are doing this, and me, the first. Did you send voice messages? Yes, perhaps. <laughs> well, the voice message is for the blind people or for the illiterates, yeah? So we can communicate when I'm blind through voice because I cannot see to text. And the same when illiterate don't know how to text but can speak. So technology can, can make fabulous things but should be digitally accessible. So to conclude, a small challenge because I also speak about opportunities, but the challenge, we definitely have to put in place algorithmic that respond to the ethic that are human-centered, that avoid bias, and all bias systems must be designed and implemented with inclusivity in mind to avoid reinforcing existing inequalities. I hope I encompass a little bit the context, and I cannot finish without thinking that collaboration from all partners is important. Governments to develop policy and strategies, you to put in place all this fantastic work and together to make this difference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, moving on to the comments, challenges, opportunities that you see uh, this year and also the outcome that you would like to achieve when it comes to AI. Yeah, good morning. Um, I think our focus uh, on the challenges uh, given um, where we come from, um, so Saharan Africa. I think there's no doubt, first of all, that um, there's no AI without digital. I think that's, that, that's a given. But when you consider connectivity, inclusivity, and um, digital skills, I think the three of them are so closely related and all sort of reinforce each other that if one is not optimal, or if one is uh, sort of weak, then the others uh, um, risk uh, collapsing. So if I start with connectivity, so today in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, connectivity is mostly through uh, mobile. Um, but unfortunately, we're in a situation where about 65% of uh, those mobile connections are still 3G, 2G. About 45% of that is actually a 2G. Now, if you look at that and you now say, well, how can that population leverage AI? I think it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, whether they're just the users of AI or participating in the development of AI, I think it's going to be very challenging for them to. Um, Exercise of either of that. I mean, in the very simplest, uh, um, if you take a step back and you uh, look at maybe the, the one uh, form of AI which is ubiquitous around the world, Google Search, for example, you still cannot have a good experience accessing Google Search or a feature form, um, which is driven by a, a 3G connection. Now, and of course, uh, the platforms as well for uh, AI, cloud computing, et cetera. The data are also for AI that you buy to uh, train AI models. Um, also require good connectivity to be able to uh, leverage that. And when you go into digital skills, with other skills, you're not going to be able to uh, make sense of uh, the AI tools or how to even uh, build the AI. So that's also another very important area. But again, 
if you're not connected, how do you access those uh, platforms to get those skills? And even if you get the skills and you're not connected, then how do you make use of those skills? Then coming back to inclusivity, again, if you're not connected, then how are you going to provide the, the, and the uh, contribute to the global data sets that's going to enable the uh, those models to be trained or even just even participate, collaborate, access the knowledge, uh, et cetera. So for me, when I look at those uh, three sort of areas, I think the big challenge for us in Sub-Saharan Africa is that we really need to accelerate all of those three areas uh, almost at the same time. Um, um, well, unfortunately, when you look at the landscape of where we are today with AI, um, and I'm quoting a, a panel, sorry, a panel session I was earlier this early in the week. Because AI is almost like where social media was in the early stages. Um, everyone believes it will do a lot of good. Um, there's a lot of money going into AI, but it's mainly being, driven, being done for profit. And of course, uh, when you look at the global landscape, this is mainly happening in the US, uh, of course, uh, in places like China and, and the other parts of the West. When you look at uh, the other parts of the world, like South Saharan Africa, I think we're really, um, uh, this is going to where I think we need to be. I really think it needs to become. Um, um, a global discussion, not just say it, but we actually need to live it and do it. It almost needs to become like uh, another SDG, whereby we say there needs to be a minimum level of uh, AI capability in every country in the world so that we can participate. Well, of course, then connectivity needs to be there. Uh, digital skills need to be there. So it's, it's really one of those things that um, I know we'll get there. How we will get there, I think we need to be very conscious and deliberate about taking the right steps. And I think that deliberate effort would determine how much of a positive impact AI will make in the world. Because I think if we if we don't address these challenges, and I like was telling uh, my co-panelist uh, earlier, who's um, half broken. Um, 70% of our population in Nigeria is below 25. So when you look at the uh, future of the global workforce, especially when you consider that in the West, uh, populations are static and in some cases even declining, you cannot have a conversation about the global workforce without Sub-Saharan Africa, because that is where the workforce of the future is. So it's almost like a collective responsibility to make sure that they are ready to uh, participate. Otherwise, I think we're going to face uh, uh, a very difficult situation in the near future. So I think to round it up, where I think we need to be, I think we need to get to a point where we're having a very serious global discussion around AI, whereby uh, we find a way where everyone can participate so that we ensure that, uh, especially on the inclusivity side, uh, the simple things, I mean, we've seen uh, in the past couple of years where we've uh, had reported cases of uh, facial recognition having high levels of uh, false detection rates on non-Caucasian faces. I mean, no one designed that or intended to design that, but I think that is, a, that is one of the consequences of not being very deliberate when we're designing these technologies, especially when we consider what the future is going to look like. Because if we're saying that 70% of our population is below 25, then I think um, we, we really need to take this very seriously. Thank you. We discussed actually where we can work with C level uh, later on. Um, hello. So we discussed already, uh, you know, challenges like access to. Uh, infrastructure, obviously, connected data and skills. One of the other challenges, all challenges that you want to emphasize again, uh, the opportunities and the outcome also looking forward. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question. I'm very honored to be amongst uh, this uh, very, very distinguished panel. And I'm very glad also to be in this uh, fantastic uh, 
um, audience um, where half are good friends and the other half are good friends that don't yet know. So <laughs> look forward uh, to getting to know you all um, before too long. Uh, my name is Carlo Totoro Brida di Bevedere. I'm Italian, uh, Italian Ethiopian. Um, if you can say my name after happy hour, you'll get a prize. <laughs> But um, I'm going to approach this from a different, um, from multiple perspectives, right? I mean, I think we all can. Uh, we all do, wear different hats. So I'm fortunate enough to have had some pretty strong experiences in different countries. Um, I grew up in Italy, and then uh, as, uh, Ethiopia was going through a big, big challenge, big revolution, and then eventually I went to live in Ethiopia as a, as a grown-up to see what I could do from, in terms of social impact. And I built an NGO uh, that was really geared at uh, reducing the digital divide and driving wealth in the country through entrepreneurship, um, making that uh, digitally and uh, diversity um, inclusive. So what I'd like to talk about today really is a little bit about my Ethiopian experience, but also I'd like to talk a little bit about you know, my experience as a European, as an American, because, of course, I run uh, the, uh, an American uh, think tank, uh, the Tofarabri Institute, and the executive chairman there. And uh, it's become now quite an influential think tank. We have some great relationships with, uh, with the NATO, with the U.S. government. Um, and we have the National AI and Cybersecurity ISAO and the executive directors here with me today, Michael Sismeyer. So, um, so I can wear multiple hats. And my perspectives are these. Um, first of all, uh, the promise of AI is really there. It's the revolution hasn't even started, but we can sense it. It's palpable, right? The transformation is there. We we're learning. We, we who are really at the top, the people that are here at the conference, we're, we're the sort of the top thinkers in, in AI. And we're discovering how to work it out, how to use it. You know, uh, I'm an AI engineer originally, uh, and I'm discovering the power that AI can, 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 can provide to the world right now. I'm beginning to use AI and LLMs in a way that I never thought was possible. And it's happening on a week by week basis, I am learning. And so therefore, if I'm learning right now as an AI engineer, you know, uh, how, how long will it take? And how are we gonna go about creating this, um, you know, bridging this digital divide and, and creating the training, the awareness and the capability, the capacity building for people that are connected uh, to be connected and to be AI capable. It's a massive, massive undertaking. And Roxana was saying earlier that, you know, she joined ITU uh, a few years back and, um, and with this mission, and the mission is only getting, you know, bigger in a sense, uh, you know, we're getting, the, the, you know, achieving this is, is going to be a big thing. And uh, there are lots of challenges. The promise it makes all the challenges worthwhile. You know, I know that in the future, in 20, 30, 40, 50 years time, the world will be undoubtedly a better place because of the power that AI has in transforming humanity. Uh, Klaus Schwab calls this the fourth industrial revolution. He saw it coming, you know, five years ago. He wrote a book about it and he was dead on. Uh, we are at the point of going through an absolute industrial revolution. We're getting to grips with it. Now, in the context of less developed countries, wow, if it's hard for us, <laughs> for my institute in California to get to grips with it, uh, you know, to, to design a path to enable the unconnected and the people that, are, that don't have access to the same level of education to be able to benefit from this, it's a it's a climbing mountain, a massive mountain. Uh, you know, I, I can't even create a mountain for that 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 depicts it correctly. Um, when we look at so first, for example, in the Western world, take Italy for example, one of my two countries of origin, uh, we have an aging population, and I'm bang there, <laughs> I'm, I'm part of those aging people, and. Uh, my, my dad passed away a few years ago, but he was incapable of using uh, an iPhone, correct? It was just too much for him. It was too much. I mean, he's a very clever guy, uh, but it was just uh, beyond his comfort zone. Um, many of us here today have parents that are aging, and they may not be 
you ha have an understanding of, of how AI can transform their lives. And AI can transform the lives of uh, elderly people in so many positive ways. And I see that because I've acted as an AI for good judge now for four years, and I've seen some tremendous new companies start up. So, so there's, there's that. Um, you know, how do we enable um, the... It's not the fringes, it's the hearts of our, of, of our people, is the elderly people. How do we enable them to benefit from AI? And then in the context of less developed countries, big problems there. Uh, literacy, for example, take Ethiopia as a case in point. Um, and I think there are many other countries in, uh, in uh, the developing uh, world that are in the same boat. Ethiopia uh, has a pretty low literacy rate um, and a very low digital literacy rate. Now, it's, it's a fast-growing country like Nigeria, uh, where, where a lot of people, uh, most of them are very, very young. So part of the problem will be resolved because young people are fast and everybody's going to have a mobile sooner or later. Um, but infrastructure is an issue. Uh, just like it is in Nigeria. Uh, so connections are really slow. If you don't have a mobile and if you, uh, you know, try to work off a landline, you've got issues. The internet is incredibly slow, painfully slow. Uh, it, 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 you have power cuts a lot. Uh, we don't think about that so much, but imagine living in a place that has, you know, constant kind of power cuts. And you know that maybe you'll, you'll have power to, to, to run your computer between four and six in the afternoon, and you're going to get your job done then with, with slow internet. That's an issue, right? Device accessibility is an issue. It's a massive issue because right now, especially, um, okay, there, there, it, there's a civil war going on in Ethiopia as well, but, but besides that, just the fact that we have the Russian-Ukrainian conflict that uh, supply chain costs are going through the roof makes it really hard to get uh, uh, devices in the country at, a, at an affordable level. This is a country where maybe 3% of the people are the wealthy people in the capital, right? Everybody else isn't, right? So in, in Ethiopia, and I think it's not the only country, the, the, the three categories I would say there are is the very rich and then the very poor, and the extremely poor. <laughs> There's not much in the middle, right? So if you're very poor or extremely poor, <clears throat> where inflation is going through the roof, where the economy that is, is measured by how much a, a, a hundred kilograms of, uh, of uh, staple flour costs, um, and it's becoming unaffordable. People cannot afford to feed their families. They can't afford to buy the staple to feed their families. In that context, how can they afford a device or a device subscription? Right. So how do we go about that? There are massive issues. Um, so for one, I would say and this is something I've been trying to drive home with the Ethiopian government for years. Um, in countries like Ethiopia, uh, in Ethiopia in particular, there are tariffs, uh, high tariffs on, on importing goods from abroad. So even if you want to manufacture devices locally, you have to pay uh, really high import duties on the raw materials. That's something that's just got to change. We've got to stop that once and for all. And we've got to plug those holes by supporting them in different ways. Um, the, there's no industrial capacity building. So there's no manufacturer of devices. There needs to be more of those in, in the country. So we need to, as a community, think about capacity building really from grassroots. We need to start developing a manufacturing sector that can manufacture devices. We need to have a telecommunications uh, organization that is not government-owned, or not government's prices or pay for this, because then you're, 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 the people are, are at the mercy of the politics, right? And in a country where, in most countries, even in Italy, we have different uh, ethnicities, if you like, the northern Italians and the southern Italians and, uh, and the folks that root for one football team or another, there's a lot of division, even in Italy, right? In Ethiopia, it's worse. Uh, if you live on the north side of the big lake, uh, you're, you're going to have an issue with the people on the south side of the lake, right? So with that kind of mentality, where you get into these kind of um, ethnic conflicts that uh, we, we, we're witnessing right now, um, the uh, neutrality of the telecommunication providers uh, is really fundamental. Uh, and um, there's, not, you know, there's not a lot we can do, but there must be things that we can do.
you know, we welcome, rightly so, as I see you, all of the heads of telecommunications, you know, regardless of what political games they might be playing in their own countries. But, but uh, they are playing political games, and those are disenfranchising a lot of people. Um, take, for example, Ethiopia, you know, the top, top, uh, the top two, let's say, ethnic groups are the Amharas and the Oromos. Uh, the Amharas count about 30 million people. Uh, the Oromos count about maybe 55 million people. It's a lot, maybe 60 million people. It's a lot of people. Uh, and when there are, um, you know, political maneuverings, uh, groups can be disenfranchised and penalized uh, by not having the right kind of accessibility uh, given to them. Anyway, uh, ramping up, um, what else did I want to say? Uh, LLMs. I want to talk about LLMs. Uh, we assume that AI is available for everybody. Ethiopia uh, does not speak English. See, that's a big benefit in Nigeria is that English is a very pervasive language. In Ethiopia, people speak uh, Amharic and Oromo primarily, and then there's about 70 other languages. And there's no LLM. Currently, we're, we've got some trials going on for, for uh, LLMs, but there, there's no system. So AI, as we use it, which is generally through generative AI, LLM models is not currently available. Um, and there isn't enough uh, written material in the language to actually run the models. So how are we gonna make AI possible? We're, this is a big, big effort uh, to um, yeah, create that capacity, that literature capacity first. Uh, and, Quite far from educating people and anything else. Anyway, I could ramble on for too long and hold the mic for a while, so I'm going to hand it over. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much, Jello. And I'm really looking forward to the second question where I think you will also tackle that a little bit more. And um, so now I'm going to you again. So I would love you to also, from your perspective, you know, what are the key uh, opportunities? I would mean, also say, you know, for AI. We heard a lot about challenges, right? I'm just wondering, of course, to, to name a few if you want. But also, you know, from your vision, you know, what would you like to see happening with AI going forward? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Diana, for, for having me. Um, <laughs> how would I like to see AI going forward? So, well, first of all, you know, like uh, in the last report that I read, probably there is a new one already out there. But in the last report that I, I remember reading about the sustainable development goals and how we depend, the goals depend on ICT or telecommunications in this case, it's about 62%. So we cannot really get there to the sustainable work that we are aiming for if we don't have the telecommunications sector working uh, across the globe fully which is also the challenging part that we are discussing today. But then the positive aspect of that is how much responsibility we have in, in the sense of how much authority this sector is uh, aiming to, to, to get there. So, in, you know, it's not the same like uh, digital literacy is not the same as dig digital practice. So I was born in El Salvador in Central America. And grab into the States and in and in Europe. Uh, you know, now I'm Belgian because I lived there for 15 years. But what I've seen, you know, across the ocean is like in Central America, everybody has a good connectivity infrastructure is very well when it comes to signals, etc. But digital literacy, specifically when we speak about infrastructure or coding or you know, like when we talk about LLMs, um, engineering and so on, it's not so much. And then we have all the tools, which is something that challenging speaking in other countries they don't have. But still, the literacy behind creating something from scratch doesn't happen. So I think the education part it has to go through the system, you know, in a very systematic way, education wise, it's not only about skilling up people, it's also like injecting the motivation and the ambition of that. So it's very different because. When we talk about sometimes we create systems to create labor force, but we don't create systems to create creators. And then that obviously sometimes comes with personality, but that's you know like uh, the big challenge, but also the big possibility we have because we have seen across the globe how AI has the power of people when they want to do something themselves, and technology has created this social mobility 
that we couldn't afford before we didn't have an option before and now you see all these things happening out of scratch and you know sometimes it pops up in, in, in the middle of a, of a different part of the blog and then they, they go around and they are like oh yeah it was you know someone did I don't know a windmill out of you know trash or something like this and then you know all of that capability it's 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 kind of like the AI feature that we are expecting to have. Now, in the challenging part, but it's also a positive thing, is that leadership should change, and it's changing, and we see it happening as well. Yesterday, uh, Tristan was mentioning this thing that I mentioned to you before. Uh, we have, in a metaphorical way, the power of the gas with technology today, with AI, in a medieval, medieval uh, century governance, which it doesn't match. So, we need to start thinking differently, and it's not it's not an attack on the governance. It's more about encouraging governance to think differently, to 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 aim differently. Sometimes we hear, you know, like at my company, for example, we we help first sector support and we help them in partnership and collaboration, and we see sometimes that they they kind of like attack each other um, in different sectors, or sometimes they just simply don't know something. And then there is a lot of time to elements because of the energy consumption. But at the same time, in parallel, I know that you know the telecommunication companies are you know doing their best to reduce that as well. So there is like this trust that only happens in collaboration and partnerships, and and it's not only the collaborations around the, the idea of everything is going to go well. But it's also about sharing the responsibility and the burden. So if we want to connect everything, and if we know that you know the future kind of like goes around in the blog and, and so on, it's not only about sharing the good moments, it's also about sharing the, the responsibility behind that. And we talk about raw materials, for example, it's the same. It's like we are benefit, benefiting from all of that, but are we actually carrying the burden of that benefit? And then, you know, it's kind of like a, if we acknowledge the power we have, we also should acknowledge the responsibility we have. And, you know, in, as a kind of like ambassador, I aim to help people, you know, not, not for, the, for the climate change situation, which is very obvious in typical speaking, but more in the sense of stewardship. You know, we are stewards of the planet. And it's very sad that sometimes we just neglect that part. It's like we don't care. Well, you wouldn't do to the planet what you eat in your home, you know, like or a rice or you wouldn't do it to your home what you do to the planet because you're the steward of your home. So it's similar in that direction and it's easier to see it that way. It's easier to be responsible that way because it's something that you share because your partners in life, you, could, you like it or not, we share the same ocean, the same sky, and there's nothing, you know. So the positive part, AI evolution in that way, Changing the mentality in in a in a positive and trying to find the connectivity and the things that are that make us alike. I think it's um yeah one of the don't thank you thank you so much. First, turning to you now. Same question. If you have just that five minutes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, being the last after so many important <laughs> things are said, it's, it's really a uh, it's a challenge. Um, let's try it. So um, maybe I will do a bit here. Um, take the first quote is from Carl. The promise of AI is here. Yes. Underline this, emphasize this. Yes. Exclamation mark. Yes. It is a Continent generation shift we are we are experiencing. Yeah, I want to be too big about it. Let's say in a generation of 30 years, that's that's a huge thing. And um, we are experiencing, and uh, Diana at the beginning said uh, or asked, said 2024 is the year of AI. Yes, it is. And 2025 is it too. Um, but the reality is that the adoption of AI has been progressive slowly over decades. So it's 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 here around for quite a while. <laughs> and it's come to our experience, it's come to, to us, it's to our, our minds, mostly since we have seen the tools, the availability 
of generative AI tools. It's a bit like ChatGPT. And here comes also the second thing, uh, what Lydia talked about. Um, four weeks ago at Hanover Messe, everything was about AI. And no one talked about ChatGPT. Why? Because LLMs are good. But a welding machine, an AI powered welding machine, they need something completely different. They need a specified um, language model behind it. ChatGPT would like a tank or an art, nothing, nothing like uh, you can do. So um, I think there's a lot about adoption uh, we need to think about. And I also think that we, what we see is there is a great tension. There are um, a great deal of intention to adopt AI. And that is our pacing, our abilities. Something like you mentioned, especially. Um, but I think that, it's, that, is, that is true. And it is, but it's not uh, it's true in, in, several, in several ways, because there is a gap between aspiration in, and ability. And um, we, Cisco, we came up with a, um, well, we wanted to research that gap and came up with a AI readiness index in, in 2023, um, where we looked at six pillars, and I don't want to share all of them. I check on the focus of the three of them, which I think are most relevant in our debate here. Um, so where, where we describe this gap, and the first one is infrastructure. Um, so having the basics here, having the basic connectivity is the one thing. And I'm not saying that's a small thing, it's a really huge thing. But then also, if you have the connectivity, like in developed countries, are you AI ready with your infrastructure? Probably not. Because AI needs a lot more of uh, a lot higher workloads, and uh, most infrastructures, especially also in companies and, uh, and in, in public sector, are never built for that. So that means you need to think about your infrastructure, and you need to think how you how you can become AI ready. And as we are here in Switzerland, um, I don't know who's from Switzerland here, but as we are here in Switzerland. Um, and this is just an example, that is because it is similar to many other countries uh, we research, is that just 10% of the local organization categorize themselves as what we call the pace setters. 10%. That's it. That's the new world. So there is there is really a lot to do. And if, if the rest, if the actually 72% uh, are lagging behind. This is this is something we need to we need to always think about. And I'm not talking about data here, I leave data outside, but it is really another another which just goes to, to, to infrastructure, another of those basics. I want to go to um, to to the question of talent because um, this is um, I think in our context here, yeah, the most or what, one of the two most relevant factors, AI at its best. It's an effective partnership of human and machine or technology. We've never seen that before. We have a lot of that relationship with uh, with whatever we trade or whatever, but it's never been like that. It's completely different. But what does it mean? And this is also what you said. It means you need to have the right talent. You need to, to have the people that can deploy and that can operate AI-driven uh, and AI-supported machines. And that's not that's not simple. It is uh, think about well, that's a welding machine. So an AI-driven welding machine that replaces maybe seventy people. That before that did that work of looking if the, or making sure that the welding point is set correctly. What are you Probably you don't want to fire them because you, you need those employees in other places, especially 
in, in those uh, societies with an aging population, but you need to train them. You need to make uh, you make uh, you need to, to to train them so that they are able to operate in an AI world. But it's not only the employees; it's everyone. After before nine and after five p.m., it's all of us. And and like you said, um, it is it is we need to we need to be able to operate the iPhone and AI is coming more and more to to. Uh, to the end devices, so we need to be able to do that, and, <coughs> and that means, again, that means we need to train people. Businesses need to do it, we need to do it on a wide scale. Basic skills to operate or to navigate, let's say, call it navigate in an AI-driven world, this is, this is elementary. The next thing is culture. I'm always saying, if you have a a technology a technological shift. It is maybe twenty percent about technology and eighty percent about change management. And what we see in our report is that businesses are quite good at strategy, that's aspiration. But they haven't thought that much about how to change their businesses. And I think that is that is really another focus we need to we need to take this fundamental cultural change in businesses, but all over societies, which comes together with um, with that talent, with uh, with the, the the need to train. Um, that is, and, and my suggestion now also here is. That, that we really look into that or we think about the next app because that's the basis. Thank you so much, Percy. All right, I would like to come back to you, Elena. Uh, so Nigeria is one of the key leaders, you can say, you know, when it comes to the digital economy. That said, as you mentioned, there's always you know a lot of time to the still ongoing. So. I was just wondering, you know, from your perspective at local level, what are you trying you know, to advance basically? Also with, you know, both public and private sectors, you were also speaking about having a global governance for AI and making sure that we, make, we really bring you know, the inclusion, we bring also uh, ways to tackle the different challenges that you have highlighted. So what, how are you trying to tackle that at this stage? Can you share a few example? What is the vision of this? Thank you. Um, I think I'll, I'll be pleased to say that we, we haven't just been uh, uh, swimming in the challenges and uh, complaining. I think on uh, reflection, uh, we, we, we've been busy over the past couple of months on the, one of the initiatives, particularly thanks to the support uh, from Cisco. Um, so I think I'll just touch on three three areas which I think are relevant to this conversation from a policy and uh, regulatory uh, perspective. Um, I think the, the first area is our AI strategy. So I've um, uh, been in the post for about seven months now and uh, my minister, I think uh, probably eight or nine months. Um, so we've, we had an existing AI strategy in Nigeria, but I think we realized very quickly that um, uh, one strategy was a few years old, and in terms of implementation, we hadn't made uh, much progress. And uh, sometimes when you have a combination of something that's old and no progress, it tells you that maybe something needs to be, you need to go back and look at it. So I think one of the key things we realized was, um, and we're honest with ourselves, in terms of capacity, the, the skills, knowledge, for AI, we didn't have it within government, and we had it. Uh, we had a bit of it within the academia, but definitely within industry because Nigeria is not a um, strong uh, uh, producer of uh, of technology. So we decided to take a different approach, where we um, fortunately we have one of the benefits of having a large population is everywhere you go, you see a Nigeria. Um, stay in the world. So we did. Uh, 
we did um, we spent some time we looked at uh, um, sort of a global AI workforce focusing on trying to find uh, people of Nigerian origin. Um, spent a few months doing that. Um, I think it was in April. We uh, managed to get about uh, just over 100 of them to come down to Nigeria. Um, I think we focused on people who had published in tier one journals. And I think for the 100 that came, we had, uh, I think we had about close to 400,000 uh, citations in tier one journals. They spent uh, four days um, in an AI workshop um, and it was really, it was really insightful because we realized actually, wow, we have all these Nigerians there, not only with the knowledge, but also willing to come back and contribute. So that kind of was the first step towards redefining our uh, revised uh, AI strategy. So the output of that we're hoping is a set of uh, policies, governance frameworks, and a roadmap uh, for implementation of the revised policies. Um, I can't remember the timelines, but uh, it's something already in motion. Um, we also have a, 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 an AI uh, a Center for Artificial Intelligence, which we also revived uh, working with, uh, with uh, Cisco. And um, we also took an ambitious step to create our own uh, LLM. Um, yes, we, uh, we speak uh, English in Nigeria. It's the uh, official language. But uh, we also have uh, four local languages that uh, outside school and business that so most people converse in. So we uh, took an ambitious step and started uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, create our own uh, LLM language in the three major languages and also in the accented uh, English, sort of like Pigeon English. Um, so that's my AI strategy, and I believe that is. That is us responding to the fact that we realize we have challenges, but actually how can we still get there using a slightly different approach? Um, then in terms of infrastructure as well, our national broadband, um, uh, national broadband plan, we have a target of uh, 120,000 kilometers of fiber uh, by 2025. So I think it might, it might sound little for a country of the size of Nigeria, but it is where we are and it's, it's something we have to do. Now, again, it's something that uh, was put in place a couple of years ago. So we decided to take a slightly uh, different approach. So we've created a, what we call the National Broadband Alliance, and it's looking to primarily do three things. Um, one is to uh, remove the barriers to the deployment of fiber. Uh, and uh, anything broadband related, because what we've seen, uh, just like they say, politics is local. Uh, so in Nigeria, we have 36 states, and uh, we have about, about uh, in Nigeria, so about 300 plus languages, right? 400, 400 languages, yeah. So you can imagine the uh, complexity of uh, going into the sub nationals and trying to uh, get things done. So one of the uh, major aims of this broadband alliance is to try to uh, the commission, the Nigerian Communication Commission has taken up on itself to sort of like create an abstraction at the subnationals so that these national infrastructure providers have a one-stop shop where they can go and say, okay, if I'm in this part of the country, if they have uh, 10 different uh, agencies you need to deal with, we will make sure that working with the subnational, that we identify who those agencies are, what the processes are, and as much as possible, try to streamline um, the processes. Then the second key thing that the Broadband Alliance is trying to uh, address is the area of um, consumption gap. What do I mean by that? Um, um, in, in, in Nigeria, you have... Um, certain areas that are logistically advanced and the economy is concentrated in certain areas of the country. So it makes sense to deploy infrastructure there because there's willing, there's a willing uh, optic of uh, whatever infrastructure you deploy. But you go to all the areas of the country whereby the return on investment is uh, questionable. And what we've seen over the years is that there's a skew in terms of where these infrastructure providers uh, put, their, put their dollars. 
So one of the areas we're trying to uh, also address, uh, primarily starting with government institutions, schools, hospitals, is to create uh, the right uh, applications that will drive the consumption of uh, uh, digital services, and in some cases through intervention also fund um, sort of um, bulk purchase of uh, of uh, um, internet uh, capacity, so that encourages and uh, guarantees the return on investment for um, these infrastructure providers. Then I think the last area is on uh, talent, uh, talent training. So um, uh, our ministry um, is running a, a talent accelerator program, and it's one of the largest in the world. We, we have an ambitious target to train uh, 3 million uh, young uh, Nigerians. Uh, we just finished with the first cohort, I believe about 30,000, so we're kind of scaling it out, starting with small number. I think the next cohort is going to be about 200,000 then. We progressively increase. They're focusing on six areas, one of which is um, artificial intelligence. And the idea is to kind of scale them up. I mean, we're not going to uh, turn them into Oxford or MIT professors, but at least let them be able to uh, leverage these AI, uh, AI tools that are coming up and hopefully by driving the connectivity and getting them skilled up, we'll start to see them create local solutions, which hopefully will create uh, a thriving uh, AI uh, uh, economy. And like I said, 70% um, of the 25, if we don't get them ready, I think uh, we'd be doing a disjustice to the world. So I think in terms of what we're doing, so it's not all challenges. We've also been hard at work trying to uh, uh, do something. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing there. So I think it's a she had a very good segue with uh, you know, the work also of ICU in terms of capacity building as well. So can I ask you, so what is the next uh, step basically? And I think you, you have a video of that I can show. Should I show it now or after? Um, I will just make an introduction because actually, without having any coordination, uh, everything you said, I cannot agree more because from the perspective of ITU, indeed, we also want to focus on three things. Awareness rising, why we do this, strengthening capacity, how, uh, what to do in concrete, and also development of resources. We have been developing only in the last five years over 75 resources on how to enhance technology, people-centered, how to for government, how to monitor how to do what to do in, in concrete at all levels to ensure that all end user regardless of age gender ability or location because you were talking so nicely and everybody here about we have to shift our mindset we we are living in a completely different world and environment so this also have to be changed in order also for us to have this holistic vision to have this to encompass everyone's needs in this digital society, but also considering the basic needs, because we are talking about artificial intelligence, as you say, if we don't have the first reading block, which is connectivity, the cable, we cannot go further. So with this in mind, yes, we are doing a lot of trainings, a lot of uh, and thanks also to, uh, to Cisco, as you know, through IQ Academy, actually we are doing all this. and. Uh, what I want to mention is that our target is that these training are digitally accessible. <laughs> so a training like this can be also be taken by a blind person, by a deaf person, by an illiterate at the end of the day. So we have to do this. Uh, I have a very short video, which is why we are doing this and how we see digital inclusion. It's about accessibility, but accessibility is a first step to go beyond to be reinforced from my perspective, as I said at the beginning, by artificial intelligence. So I strongly believe that artificial intelligence can boost every single building block here. So if we do have three, two minutes, yeah. Sorry. 
<laughs> we wanted to put it a little yes. bit bigger, yes. but I like yes. to do like this. Let's it's, it's try. Yeah. It's digitally accessible, so it's a. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a good coffee break. Head on over now to the center stage in room A on the ground floor to see how technology like AI powered exoskeletons can empower people with disabilities and change the future of mobility. See you soon. Thank you. Great. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. We still have a few 30 minutes here you know, before we close the next week. Thank you so much, Rukia, by the way, for uh, you know, bringing the live slide. Uh, we have. Uh, I would say 10 good minutes before we open the floor for quick comment question. So I will quickly go to, to you, Lydia, and then um, Carlo and then Percy. So yeah, I would like just to come back a little bit to what you were saying. And, and of course, also part of your role as EU climate ambassador is we need to you know, make sure that we uh, reach out to more people also to make sure that they understand how we can uh, achieve and advance your sustainable development, development goals. So, what are the policies that you think would help in terms of moving barriers and maybe help all, all of us, you know, getting there faster from your perspective and the discussion that you have? Thank you. Um, so recently, probably you saw it in, in the news, like this week was the um, launch of the AI office, office for example. Um, and then you can see also like the goals of, of uh, the EU has around this um, this office or this uh, garden in the case of, of team. So mostly in the, in the terms of ethics and respectful and respectfulness about it, but we also have the EU Act. I think the policy behind the policy is that people actually read the books, which is a very long document, right? <laughs> Maybe that's the truth. But it's also, I think, uh, in my, you know, like, a, as an ambassador, not only me, but also like the community of ambassadors, what we try to do sometimes is that we kind of like do the, the AI work of translating the translation. And depending on the sector, we help, you know, like uh, the scientists or so on and sectorial to understand, you know, like what is meant, the practical steps to get there, bringing the esoterical to, to the ground floor. And sometimes we also have the very difficult challenge to to, to, to try also in a way, in a very respectful way, to educate the policymakers because the, 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 the conversation back on birth might not resonate completely. So it's good that policymakers are, are doing all this work and they have the, the, the great intention to, to put all, all of it together. But in the, the ambassadors community, we bring communication forward to the sectors and the society, but we also bring it back to the policymakers, which it helps in a way the dialogue because um, it's very easy to 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 see everything or to write something based on your own knowledge, and that's it. But we also have the problem of lack of expertise sometimes, or lack of passion, which is the biggest problem. Um, and then when you combine all of that, I mean, you know, like you partner with sectors and you partner with uh, different people around, then you have a, a flourishing garden that you know now you understand each other, now you you can communicate, you now you sometimes even we have seen it that even the wording and the challenge has changed because this dialogue happened, which is very helpful because like this you, you hear or you see the policymaker is also listening to the people. So um, I think to, to answer your question is like reading, analyzing, conversation, and also challenge. You know, uh, the EU has this public uh, statement sometimes and they also do public advising um, to, 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 to help to, to hear the citizens and to hear the, the sectors. So I, I encourage you, you know, like I mean I encourage the sectors in general to participate in this in this public hearings because it's important and then also to avoid the oh, being complacent, you know, why you know like a, it's very easy to, to point out and say the policymaker is not doing the right job, but then you didn't also participate in the public hearing. So it's good to have this, you know, Dual participation back and forth. I think um, that's one of the things that I see. Yeah, stakeholders engagement. Oh, please. Stakeholders engagement. 
and uh, and really making sure that uh, everyone has a, a voice and of course that we bring more transparency. That's pretty good. Yeah, so, uh one thing that we didn't really discuss so far is actually cybersecurity, you know, because this is also something that is very key to make sure that AI is also, you know, a technology that people feel safe using. And I think she will to bring your role. I would love to hear from you, you know, what is and of course we don't have a lot of time left, but if in two per minutes you can summarize a little bit, you know, the challenges that you see there and how we can try to respond to that. Thank you. Yeah, I think the challenges are big uh, and uh, they're massive, and the answer is education. So I can actually drop the mic right now. <laughs> but uh, just to be a little bit more, to add a little bit more color, um, there is, even in the United States where we operate from, there, you know, we assume that, uh, sometimes we assume that uh, the, uh, the disconnected are the ones that need the most education. But actually, quite often, it's actually the policymakers and the politicians that actually need that awareness and that education, right? So over in the U.S., uh, we have uh, one of our board directors, the former Assistant Secretary of Defense of the United States, who runs an organization called Building Cybersecurity we work with. He is proposing to actually do White House briefings on uh, uh, at Congress and Senate on cybersecurity. And I think that's an excellent idea because... Even in a country as advanced, if you like, as the United States, there's a knowledge gap there. And this is something that the policymakers and the politicians really need to, um, uh, you know, get, get to grips with. So um, I think education is important. And it, where we direct the education, it's really, we got to direct it everywhere. In addition, um, security is uh, really, uh, it's a big issue. Already right now, cybersecurity is an, uh, an issue throughout the world. Uh, the amount of cyber conflict is huge. It's damaging um, countries, it's damaging businesses, it's damaging hospitals. We, we have, uh, we, we've got a real problem there. We've got ransomware issues. Uh, and AI is actually, uh, has been used by criminals to further their uh, various plots in a very effective way. So, um, so there's, there's that aspect that needs to be considered where really everything is accelerating. So there has to be more knowledge around understanding AI as an attack vector. But AI is also the new uh, surface uh, attack uh, um, target, right? So right now there's a lot of uh, uh, things that cyber criminals are doing in order to destroy or steal your AI knowledge. There is data poisoning. Um, that's uh, you know feeding uh, feeding uh, the wrong kind of data to create bias. Now imagine how that could destabilize uh, a country if you're favoring one one uh, uh, group rather than another. And that can you know it, it affects all minorities. So that that could be a real issue. It's very much a, a, a something that could disenfranchise parts of the population. Uh, there's a potential of denial of service uh, uh, attacks by overwhelming an AI system. Um, model stealing is something that uh, has been happening now and has become more and more uh, prevalent, which is where you basically ping and quiz your, your uh, for example, an LLM to really understand how it works, and then you basically steal the model that way around. It's a massive task, but people are doing it. There is uh, attacks like you would never think, but... For example, when you look at, uh, at uh, uh, the way that a self-driving vehicle, for example, looks at, uh, at a stop sign, uh, you think, okay, I, I understand it's a stop sign. But what you can do as a, as a criminal is to actually just make one change of one pixel. And because you're, what you're doing is that you're adding some noise in the system, and then that just one pixel that you cannot detect, you think still, if you're human, you say that's a, that's a stop sign. That one pixel change makes the uh, AI system think that it's a, it's a speed limit. And then suddenly you don't stop in the crash, right? So what we're seeing now, and I've been talking to some luminaries and ransomware just this uh, last week, and uh, they're saying what's happening now is that ransomware doesn't necessarily stop at whether or not you pay the money. Uh, people are now saying, well, if you don't pay the money, uh, I'll, I'll make uh, you know, your home go on fire by accessing your IoT devices. I'm going to uh, get your wife's car to drive off the road, uh, and I can do that. So pay me the money. So big issues. Uh, there's, uh, the answer is security by design. 
I think uh, that's something that's really important. We need to look at uh, putting the stack in front of the DevOps and really starting to build software that is uh, secure from the ground up and not never give up on security. With AI for Good, I've been, uh, I've been looking at a lot of new startups. And apart from a few superstars like we have in the room here today, Anna Tucker uh, from Etrire, uh, 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 which is a phenomenal uh, HR-oriented uh, uh, startup AI related bias. But uh, generally, security is an afterthought. And that's a real shame because some of these systems are going to be pervasive. They're going to be important. They're going to be nationwide. And uh, they're going to be evidently hackable. So we've got to start dealing with that right now. Thank you so much, Jim. Zero trust. All right. Uh, Percy, uh, last question for you before uh, I go to the audience. I would like just to know, so we've heard a lot of different things, right? Accessibility, um, security, of course, infrastructure, education, education keeps coming back, right? So you have been also talking a lot at local level. So in Germany, for example, with the different lenders about the European AI Act and how to implement it in the right way. Can you tell us a little bit? So what is really like their top focus and how, as a even private sector, you try to also address those uh, concerns and make sure that you implement it as private sector in the right way? Thank you. Yeah. If I may, first, first, I would like to say something on cyber security. Yeah. Um, yesterday, I know who, who, who joined that uh, session, there was this interview, what's it called, an interview keynote uh, with Sam Walker. Yeah. And um, uh, what, what I found interesting, I mean, many things, uh, if you could think about it, but what I found interesting was well, just at the beginning, uh, he picked cyber security as one of those areas which will be massively affected by AI, and it is true. But it's both ways. It is, we will see that AI will drive the, um, uh, will drive the bad boys, but it's also an opportunity to, to make a better system. We came out with HyperShield, which is the first AI-driven uh, Cyber security solution. So I think it is it is something. What what it's what's always with new technology. It's black and white, and it really depends on how you use it. But uh, security by design, not only since AI, that's a prerogative. Now, sorry on your question. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot it. Uh, no, yeah. Um, I think um, I think that. So yeah, we, we, we've done a lot of uh, workshops uh, and outreach to the German states uh, because we thought that with AI, there's a new opportunity to discuss uh, technology uh, with, with the government um, in Germany. Um, and, uh, and what I've experienced there is the same gap I've been talking about earlier. Um, public sector is still discussing how to implement cloud. So it is, it is, so, <laughs> okay, I said the one. Yeah, it, is, it, it, is, it isn't only a German experience, but I'm talking of Germany, as it is <laughs> country, so, uh, but I know it is, it's further, right? so it's a big thing. <laughs> if you don't have cloud, AI is a dream. And um, and I think that is that's a, a reality. They are ambitious. They see a lot. They they want to be uh, lagging behind, but it is still this issue. You know, in, in Europe we are also discussing uh, digital sovereignty. So sovereign sovereign so, solutions, which is which is on the one hand good, but it, you always need to to keep in mind what is your goal. What do you want to reach? How do you want to reach it? And um, and then the other thing uh, is um, the cultural, like the the skills gap. Um, we have together with eight companies, eight other companies, I think. You mentioned it earlier. Um, we started Cisco started a um, new consortium just a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, which is focusing on. Uh, the ICT workforce, 
and the impact on AI on the ICT workforce. Because in the moment, we are always talk, we are always talking about AI has an impact. And I made an example for OPU before, and that is true. But we don't really know what the impact is, and so we want to really look into that impact, what that could be, and how that will look like. And we will focus at the same time on upskilling and reskilling. Uh, because with, with every that, that's that's something you know before before you know what exactly the change is that with the change you need to to re and upskill people because the world won't be the same afterwards as it is before and uh, and so I think these are these are really the things we're seeing Germany what we need to discuss even for the next years and and really help governments here to find that strategy, uh, which is part of the digital transformation strategy, and at the same time, help governments, this is assumed, to, yeah, upskill, reskill their employees, and, and also, again, to bring basic skills, basic IT skills, basic AI skills, to at best all society all people perfect thanks so much for the session we are pretty online with this just want now to turn to the audience we have time for one question maybe i'll go to you so good afternoon or actually good morning uh my name is jason so how do we as the international community the national governments pushing these things even the uh, developing nations that are doing their first national digital strategy and or their national cyber strategy, and as we noticed here. We always focus on access, and then there is some other conversation about security, risk management, preventing harms, etc. When, how do we get the strategic goals, the strategic objectives, to be reflective of access and managing risk at the same time, so we can stop thinking about these things as two separate problems. Uh, I'm curious as to your thoughts and how we can maybe do it. Thank you so much. I'll take the over question and then I'll ask each one of you to wrap up in one minute with only these questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Hannah, and as part of managing my startup, build AI model to make hiring unbiased. Um, we offer that in product to both companies, but also to talent that's pretty excluded from the job market at the moment. So with that, we've gotten quite some experience in uh, products, making products accessible. And I think there are two really, really big issues that I would love to hear uh, your insights on. So one is just, how do we how do we make sure that we build more products that are really accessible? Because it's really a technical question. We're honestly product teams on most companies at the moment just have no idea at all how to build it in an accessible way. The process that you, know, that you use, the knowledge that you need is totally different. So we ourselves build a totally new product process internally. We are, just to give an example, our engineers have to, instead of prototyping new ideas internally, we have to go into poor areas in Mexico City where we prototype directly with potential users. Because we're so far away from their reality that it's totally impossible to um, intuitively imagine what they're going to interact uh, like, right? So I think there my question is, what have you seen what's happening? Because I think right now there is just not such a big incentive for companies to change the way they work. It's not something you learn in uni. It's not something that people learn on most of their jobs because people, like, most products are built for people like us, right? Never connects with the second question. I think. The big point is most products are built for people like us because we have more money, um, because it's more simple, it's much more convenient. So I mean, like what you really see happening a lot, I mean, we're in the time every day at least two new fintechs are accredited on the market. Everybody says we're so accessible, we're making financial services accessible. They're not really because they are really also not incentivized because those are not the populations that have um amounts of money that are going to generate the same profit, right? So I really understand as well that it doesn't make so much sense for them to go for the population in poverty that would need it. 
So I'm really curious because I think that's a, that's a really big challenge. If you've seen any business models that are managing to like, like nonetheless generate profits, although this is a population that cannot pay that much. Two great questions. Thank you so much. All right, you just one minute. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Oh, it's all right. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I think. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Sorry. Uh, just yeah. to a little bit of a segue to what she said. Yeah. It's about Cisco's role in wait, wait. making. Okay. You, you the, the mic. <laughs> oh, it's just for the recording. <laughs> so it's not going to be a long question. Just an, an addition to our question. My name is Kone. And I'm a friend of Cisco. So I want to know, or I'm curious about Cisco's role about driving that inclusive future for what she just described about, you know, the concentration, I call it the AI concentration. All the money is from the big players, right? You know, it takes $100 million to train an LLM, for example. And I don't think $100 million is sitting around in sub Saharan Africa to that point, right? So what's Cisco's role in, you know, making it a level playing field? More like, you know, trying, making it equal. Right? Yeah. Thank you. All right, I'll uh, respond straight away. I won't be able to respond on Cisco because I'm not from Cisco, but in general terms, my final remarks that I think wrap up uh, the other two questions as well are, you know, this, this is about connecting the unconnected, but uh, I, I think what we need to bear in mind is why do we want to connect the unconnected, and that's uh, to enable communication. Right, communication is the most important thing. And what does communication mean? It really means bringing people together uh, as one from different parts of the world, right? Creating these partnerships that are international partnerships and uh, really opening the world through communication, making us one big brotherhood and, and sisterhood of people that, uh, that, that are able to communicate with, with each other no matter where we are so that we can form new partnerships between people in Canada and people in Southern Africa and people in uh, East Asia. You know, that's the dream, right? It's about coming together and partnering and then resolving some of these issues together. So, um, yeah, my final words, I think Metaverse will play a big part in this in the future. Uh, I'm a big believer in Metaverse. A lot of people throw rocks and tomatoes at me if I say the word Metaverse. But I'm a big proponent, and I think that the Metaverse uh, will become also a, a fundamental part of our future of uh, this, you know, becoming one happy humanity. Here you go. Take care. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, just I want to just talk a little bit about uh, how, how to put this together and how to. Um, I think, you know, like in Europe, they have these foresight units. Um, and then you see that in different countries also like are popping up more and more. And the process units are concentrating basically only in the future. So once you know the future in a way, obviously it's not fully, but once you know the future in a way, you can track back and create a path and a roadmap. So it's easier in that way than, than trying to assess every step of the way. Um, and sometimes it works very well when it comes to technology, technologies are really on the go. And because of that, um, there is also like the difference in between reality and narrative when it comes to, you know, we're talking about policy or we're talking about, you know, talents or so on. Once we acknowledge reality and instead of concentrating only in the narrative, uh, acknowledging reality helps to, 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 to navigate the problems in, in, the, in the real way and we can prepare for that. But if we only concentrate in the narrative, uh, we are creating an illusion and then eventually it's going to work. So, you know, that crystal illusion is not uh, reliable in that direction. And because of that, we can concentrate in the difference of transition technologies versus next generation technologies. And that helps a lot to create a roadmap, to create a strategy, and to actually have a practical steps into the future in that direction. Uh, because there is a lot of us into transition technologies, which is not a bad thing. You know, when we talk about L um, LLM, LLM, LLMs, um, we are sometimes forgetting about the sensorial. And the sensorial here is it's creating an alphabet and a dictionary into the different languages that eventually is going to, or the idea is creating one language in frequency. So because of that, um, may, maybe in some countries that we already have enough, maybe uh, creating more of those might not be the next generation technology, but it's all transition. So we have to be careful also when navigating those things. It's not because everybody's doing it that we have to do it as well. So it's uh, my minister. Uh, 
I will not repeat. So I would just build on it and add. I think also for the businesses, you have to add one, have to go to the next step. You cannot do business as we have been doing 10 years ago or even five years ago because technology is evolving so quickly that also our mindset as businesses in, in, in the business process should change. And I will respond to everyone. So for the access of security, I think uh, considering from design, it's absolutely compulsory. It's the same from accessibility. And by the way, in Europe, we have European Accessibility Act. I didn't want to mention because we are globally here. But simple, European Accessibility Act is now generated compulsory requirements. Compulsory requirements means every business, everything you do as a project, as a service, should be digitally accessible. So should have embedded accessibility standards or requirements from design. If not, you cannot sell it. Why to do? It's a win-win. So how, from one perspective, yes, we say, well, it's difficult to do it. Why to do it for a portion of people? No, it's not for a portion of people. And here I want to, to make a small stop in particular for you. Um, for a business, to increase business value, you have to have more end users. So actually, attracting more end users, either with disabilities, it is whatsoever, it's increasing your business value. So it is an incentive. But more than this, we were talking about older person, and I didn't want to touch on it because I'm also <laughs> focal point for older person. Two thirds of the world population in the next 30 years will, he, will be 60 and above. 60 and above means age-related disabilities. So everybody in this room who has more than 30 years, okay, <laughs> we are talking about us, <laughs> okay? So whatever products and service you will build now within your business, make it digitally accessible. Otherwise, your business value will strongly and violently go down. So this is what I want to say. And for the very, very last uh, thing, yes, it is challenging because even our language here is not aligned. We talk about connectivity, thinking perhaps of connecting people. We talk about accessibility, but we refer actually to affordability. So let's try to evolve ourselves, to train ourselves, to speak properly and accurately when we address things, and I think together we can make it. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point, uh, because also accessibility reminded me that former CEO of us, he talked about the CEO button. You need it uh, at any device, make it, make it simple. But it's it? a different meaning of accessibility. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, no, um, I wanted to say something about this um, this idea, great idea, thinking about opportunities at risk at the same time. We came up, I think, what, 2015 or 16, so really far, away, far longer, with a, with a report, um, which I like because of the picture it painted. We, uh, this, this report was called Digital Vortex. And, and the idea is basically uh, each business gets into this digital vortex and comes out with you know, crashes as a digital business. What this picture lacks bit is that a digital business is not a panel. Yeah. It's always going on. So this vortex is going on, so to say. And I think, um, yeah, it is all a strategy of digital transformation. And that has both opportunities and risks and and you can't you can't uh, uh, thrive in, in 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 a digital transformation if you don't think it together it's it's a lot about um for example security by uh, by design uh privacy by design it is something you need to take into designing uh solutions and um risks is just another word for Opportunity you don't see in the moment. Uh, really, that, that sounds a bit simple, but I think uh, I believe in it, and, and I think it is. And, and I experience that, especially in my dis discussions with public sector, that 
mostly the risks are stressed. And but that they 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 don't focus on what they want to gain. And and if you if you think about what's what is what you, what you want to get what you get out of digital transformation, is it um, a digital a digitized uh, um, government process you want to have because this makes it easier. It makes your it, it has an opportunity for your for your citizens to access uh, um, the, the, the to have better access to to the uh, to your products. Then it is quite easy. What you what what's risk and what are some opportunities, and you need to take both into your account. That's I think it is something you need to think you need to have on your radar from the beginning. That's fine. I think I'll probably merge the uh, three questions because I kind of see some of my relation or um, I kind of uh, have a perspective. Um, when I combine the three. Um, I think I've really seen where you get the balance right between uh, pushing the boundaries and really wanting to innovate and also being worried about security. I think um, typically innovators, they don't, if you start talking about security, you, you kind of get yourself excluded uh, <laughs> from the conversation. But saying that, I think um, you made a point that some of these things we don't learn in uh, uni or through formal education. But I think as part of the drive to build the right digital skills, maybe we need to start reinforcing things around data privacy, data security, and as part of basic education. That's a very, very early stage. I mean, um, yes, we're all over 30, and <laughs> so it's probably too late for us, but. Uh, Maybe for the next generation, they really need to be the same way they teach them the alphabets. As they're growing up, maybe they need to start understanding the importance of uh, digital security and uh, data privacy. And perhaps when they become innovators, it will be actually part of their thinking straight away to be saying, you know what, yes, we're going to push the boundaries, but actually we need to um, uh, be careful here. Because there are certain things you just know that you don't touch fire. And that's either because you've been burnt before, or actually somebody has made it very, very clear to you that this is hazardous from a very early age. So I think um, my last words, I think, is just to really emphasize the need for that uh, global conversation so that we ensure everybody has a seat at the table. And uh, um, product developers like yourself, you can actually then have a global market space. Thank you. If, if I may, because I like this <laughs> one, sir. Uh, but that reminded me of something. It is like driving a car. If you want to drive a car fast, so if you want digital transform fast, you need to have brakes. Otherwise, you can't drive fast. So that's a bit, bit the picture of cyber security. So just about that. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And you know, this is extremely inspiring to hear from all of you. So thank you so much. And thank you also to all the audience, you know, for contributing and for sharing your thoughts. And I really hope that we can continue the discussion. I would like to conclude on this quote, you know, from Kevin Bob and Martin was our hostess this week uh, at ITU. And so just continue the discussion about how can we make sure that these 2.6 billion people who are still offline today, we can bring them on the internet and make sure that their voice is also reflected in the AI tomorrow. Thank you and uh, have a very nice end uh, of the ITU uh, AI good event. Thank you. <laughs>